good morning, afternoon, or whatever the time of day it is where you're at, Shinigami viewers. It is the next video in the Palace Athene Restore video series. So, if you saw the last one, you will have seen that I was doing some scribing, and the scribing is done. So, it's all disassembled here because after the scribing, the next piece is the painting, and that's what we're going to try to do today. Uh, not without a little science experiment and testing. So, this is the whole model disassembled, and I've kept to, I don't know if it's just for my own sanity and my own way of wanting to do things. I keep it separated by, like, body part, and I tried to kind of generally go from top to bottom. Because what you have here is, over here is set aside, here's your, like, rocket nozzles and those little bits and bobs there. And they're already metallic painted. I'll probably do some sort of a wash to grime them up just a little bit, just to add some realism. But they're already painted silver where they'll be exposed on the model, so at least they'll look like metal and not like a five-year-old's plastic gun. So that's cool. Anyway, let's take a little we got over here. We got our beam effects for the weapon set aside, and we'll just determine what kind of color we want to do that. I haven't decided, and frankly, I don't have to right now. It's We can come back to that. Um, here's the actual weapon itself um, that will be painted. Everything is going to be painted, by the way. Um, the eight little rocket-guided, little rocket-guided missiles, massive rocket-guided missiles. They're going to probably get some kind of a chrome paint. I don't metal of some sort, you know what I'm saying? Um, probably the same thing that I did with those other rocket nozzles. I just, I don't know, I haven't gotten around to getting to it yet, but it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll paint that with that. Moving along, the little wing shields on his back where the rockets are mounted. And as you can see, they are also described. I, I, don't, I don't know, I just didn't feel like going too crazy with describing on the wings. A, A, did not want to copy the one that I showed you, and B, I think I actually just want to do some really cool, tasteful uh, water slides on those wings. Um, I have a lot of larger options to choose from that would look really nice on that wing area there. And then here's the backpack where the wings attach with the little um, connector bobbies there. Now, those look a little rough to your eyeball right now, but they feel smooth to my nail, so I'm hoping, and I'll know once I prime them, whether that will be invisible because I've tried to go anywhere where the model looks cheap to where there's like the hollowness of the parts and fill that in with like a putty or a super glue. That I did with a putty. Now in hindsight now, I know I want to do this process with the super glue and baking soda. It just produces a way better result. Um, as you saw on the last video of the of the um, the forearm, like I can almost guarantee you, it'll look perfect once the primer's on it, and we'll show you that later. We'll come back to that later. But there there may be some imperfections in the shape of it. Honestly, even if it is, I'm not all that worried because like the, where that piece is aiming in the model itself, you'd hardly have to be looking for it to notice if there's a little bit of a of a bump or an indentation. But at least when I run my nail across it, it feels fine because I sanded it until it was a uniform feeling sandedness across the part, you know what I'm saying, whatever, anyway, um, where else we got here, shield scribed, ready to roll, um, some little metal pieces that need to be, I, I've decided they are going to be painted metal, and you have like basically the uh, joint that connects the shoulder to the torso, and then the joints that connect the upper arm to the lower arm, and then of course those are hands, um, and then we have the head here, and I chose to keep the head separate because of the difficulty of painting this head, because uh, right here, like the inner dome of the helmet itself, I tried to assemble this thing and see like how could I possibly creatively mask this with those little fingers that go over the dome that you can see at the top there. And I just couldn't find a, a satisfactory solution for that. So I'm actually keeping the head apart, and what I did was I actually took what was a seam line on the back of the head and I actually beveled it. So it will look like an intentional seam line, like if it were a real robot, and I got it to what I think visually will look good, so I can keep these pieces separate and paint them to my satisfaction. And I think I'll actually, if you see the part here, like the, the visor here, I think I'm actually going to make the little back of the helmet, like a continuation of the visor, because we're going to save this robot, like he's got cameras in the back of his head, you know? Because like when you watch the Gundam show, they're in that cockpit and they can see all around and shit, so I'm just going to say, yeah, they got cameras all over their head, whatever. It's the imagination of what I'm trying to create. Anyway, moving along, here's the shoulder pieces, and then they've got the little yellow accent pieces there, you can see. And I'm pretty sure that uh, that inner thing there, like I said in an earlier video, that's some sort of like a beam weapon or a, a cannon of some sort. So I'm probably going to do that with a metallic um, forearms with their yellow accents you see there. Um, 
again, with my kind of, what do you call it, executive decision I made here, this is the chest. And when assembled, I don't really see any like problematic seam lines. So I chose to keep this in parts so it'll be easier for me to paint. When we assemble, I will still kind of mask it because even if you're gonna paint the whole part a uniform color, you still wanna mask off the parts where your paint's not gonna go because if you don't do that, it makes, it adds mass and bulk to the connectors and stuff doesn't go together very well. It's a problem, I've made that mistake so many times before. But we're gonna do all that as we go. Um, what are the parts we got? I'm moving along here. And then here's like the tail section and there's like this actual like tail tail. That's where that big metal piece goes inside of this. We'll go in there. And then, you know, the, the thighs, and then the thigh armor we got ready to rock here. And then the lower legs with its two different, like a front and back casing. And I've actually done to demonstrate how it would be masked. And I just, I just, dude, I straight up use a Lowe's painter tape. Unless it's like a super tiny detail, I have some like hobby painter tape for the tiny, tiny little pieces. And I may use them on this project today, but when I can get away with it, I like using just the straight up Lowe's uh, blue tape for, for painting. It's cheaper and you know, it's less work with 30 pieces than maybe two or three. And you just have to kind of do a process that I'll go over later in the video. And then here's the feet. And I did also make another executive decision on the feet because I didn't really feel satisfied with the way that the, uh, the opposable heel pieces came down. They kept falling off and I'm like, you know, I'm not really gonna oppose this that much. It's gonna sit on the shelf. So I just did make a decision to glue them in place. Um, it will also provide some more stability to the model standing. I did find that even though I glued them in place, I could still do some posing with the legs. It's just like, you know, cause there's, there's, there's ultimately a knee joint and an ankle joint here. So you can still get some, get some pose in action without having the heel itself be able to adjust. That's cool. It still works fine. Um, and that's it for Palace Athene being ready to paint. Um, moving along here, now that we've seen the model and stuff, uh, I'm coming over here to, um, shit uh what we're doing here with the paint and like i do i am going to torture an sd before i do some actual paint on the model um we have our supplies ready today we have our swatches and we're going to go over all that now this is like my first time i've ever like airbrushed something like a different color i did airbrush my high gog but it was like such a, a zero effort change it was like a slight different hue of blue that i don't even count it like yeah, it taught me how to use an airbrush gun to acceptable standards. So that was technically my first airbrush. But this is like my first like real airbrush. Like we're going to really do some stuff with paints and colors and, and such. Anyway, um, we have all our supplies here. I'm going to sand with this dupla color primer, which you're like, why are you sanding or why are you priming with a rattle can when you have an airbrush? Because this stuff is awesome and it's less shit for me to have to clean up. Because every time you run a color of paint through your airbrush, and I only have one airbrush right now. You gotta tear it down, you gotta clean it out, and all this stuff, and I'm gonna have to do it as is. I'm gonna have to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, probably eight times I'm probably gonna have to tear this down. So that's one irritation. But also, this just is a really good product. Um, my really good friends at the Cutting Mat Podcast introduced me to this stuff, and it's just, it, it does a really good job of, of priming a surface so the paint adheres. Um, it is sandable as it is an auto body primer. It's not only that, it's like a really good product, but it's way cheaper than like your Citadel rattle can primers, and I think it performs better. Um, I've tried several different rattle cans before I had an airbrush, and this is by far the champ. So we're gonna stick to what works. Um, I was kind of debating some colors, whether I was going to prime it in white, gray, or black. And I, may, I, I'm, I might have to have a chat with the boys and see what they recommend me do, because I'm not sure. I feel like maybe yellow, white might be the best, especially for the yellow. It's gonna be a bit of a bitch to get that yellow pop. We'll see what they recommend if they'd say black, white, or gray. I have them all, we'll, we'll make that decision down the road. Anyway, what we're gonna to do to test it is, well, I've already tested the paints, by the way. I should go back, because I've already made the decision of these colors, pretty much. Um, although I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, I originally was gonna say, like, what, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is that I'm gonna keep the palace at the end the same color scheme, just different variations of the color, right? So, when you paint with paints, uh, when you paint with paints, um, especially acrylics, as opposed to enamels, they are translucent, so you have to have a color under the color to make the color look right. Because it's gonna, you're literally gonna, you're going to see this through your paint. So you know, for 
a lot of these paints, like uh, for example, uh, Apple Seed here, which I showcased on a on a preview video, says for most vibrant results, apply over a green undercoat. So I'm doing what it says, and you do that for a reason, as I showed in another video. Um, and different colors of green will make different results, which you're about to see. But um, the base colors for the model are, you know, I'm replacing the blue with this beautiful Liquitex blue that really makes things pop, as you'll see. Um, I'm going to do two variations of the green because, as I said, the top coat is translucent, and different colors of green will produce different end results, as you're going to see. Pretty cool stuff. Um, there's a lot of green on this model, so I did want to break it up with two different shades of green. It's a common tactic in airbrushing to get a, a nice looking result. And then a vibrant yellow for the yellow, of course. So yeah, here's our base colors. Um, and then here's our, our final colors here that are going to go on it. As stated, Appleseed, um, Pucker, and then Cool Ranch. And I was kind of thinking about like also maybe messing around with the Absinthe. There's not a huge difference between the Absinthe and Appleseed, except they're a, they are a, I guess you could say the Appleseed's a little yellower in the spectrum, um, but they're pretty close. I don't know, I'll, I'll fool around with it, but for the swatch that I'm about to show you, it was all entirely with just apple seed and the two different base colors. So here's our test swatch because I wanted to see how the colors would turn out. And I hope my camera kind of catches it pretty well. I think it is. Um, but at the bottom there, the bottom two panels, you're seeing the two variations of the green. It's the same green top coat, just with a different undercoat. And you can see how much of a radical difference it makes in the greens. So it will provide a variation of greens on our model. Um, and look at how amazingly that blue pops with the Liquitex blue underneath of the Cool Ranch Turbo Dork, um, as well as my, my pucker here. Now this was done with a brush, so you know airbrushing will of course have a smoother effect, plus I literally painted this on wood. I didn't care about texture per se. I just needed to see what the colors, the final colors are gonna look like. Cause you know, this is essentially my set and sewn decision for colors and I know at least what hue and color the colors are going to be on the model at this point. Um, so yeah, that's that's our color decisions here. And then, you know, we're gonna test them with the SD parts. I'm gonna just do a couple test pieces and I'm just taking his armor pieces. And what I'll do is I'll do the um, I'll do the primer on top. I mean, let's just pretend I couldn't ask the guys how I think the colors are gonna look. We're gonna know here. Cause um, we'll use the dupa color um, primer and then we'll let that dry. And then we'll do the, a couple coats of the base coat, let that dry. And then we'll do the turbo dork. Now, when you're running paint through an airbrush, you really probably ought to be cutting your paint um, with a medium. And Liquitex literally makes an airbrush medium. There are different brands. It's usually more or less the same thing. It's just stuff that you mix with your paint to give it a quality that makes a satisfactory result running through an airbrush. Um, and let me see, see it says it, it kind of takes your colors to a water-like state with binding properties, extends color, increases transparency. Um, which is things that you want when you're airbrushing something. Um, where the hell did it say on the bottle? Okay, there you go. Um, that was written down below it. Uh, it says, you know, use it in a one one ratio with color. Do not add water. Compatible with all Liquitex products. Surprise, it's compatible with other acrylic products as well. But, so the bottle says one to one ratio, right? The cool thing about Turbo Dork, because there's a lot of confusion on Turbo Dork, which there shouldn't be. Um, if you try to use it just like you use other paints and just think it's going to work, you might be a little confused with, you know, different things like it's consistency and running it through an airbrush and stuff. But the great thing about this, fortunately for me, especially being a noob, is that Greg from Turbo Dork on the website shows you and tells you how to cut it and mix it, right? So let's hop on over here. Here's the page of his tips and tricks on the Turbo Dork website. Let's see... There's just all kinds of different information here, but what we need, as you're seeing there, um, let's see. We start with, um, of course, like I said, sticking to the color recommended on the bottle, which we just talked about. Using a different color will give an unexpected result, and sometimes for good, but right now we're learning. Um, two to four thin, even coats of paint with the airbrush. Do not use a single thick layer. That's just painting 101, because it will look lumpy, it won't uh, level very well, and it, 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 you're, we're gonna want like a kind of as close to a candy shell as we can get for what we're trying to do. And he says, uh, start with the .05 nozzle, 25 to 30 PSI, which that's pretty standard for airbrushing models. And then by diluting uh, three parts paint with one part medium, but he says if you have a .3 nozzle, you might wanna do two parts paint to one part medium. So the lesson we're learning here, because it's, 
you know, down the road, I'm not going to follow off this page. Down the road, I'm going to learn from my trial and error and make my own decisions on how I want to dilute. Um, but what we got here is uh, the website or the Turbo Door page. It says three parts paint, one part medium. Liquitex says a one to one. So this definitely, obviously, because it's the product and the product, this definitely you want to do a one to one because we're just going to literally follow the instructions on the bottle. And then this is a three to one. I still, I, I gotta see what my nozzle is, but I might actually start with a two to one ratio. Well, no, I might start with a three to one ratio with my testing spraying. And then if I feel like it's not giving me the coat look that I want, I'll add a little more or a little, yeah, a little more of it, take it to a two to one. We'll kind of like start with it a little thicker and then thin it out if we feel it needs to be thinned out until we find our ratio. I mean, I trust Greg's suggestions here for sure. Um, I, I, he used a different brand of airbrush medium. I can't remember. They're going to more or less behave the same, but I want to see what it does with um, with this airbrush medium and kind of a tweak it as we go. Um, and we'll learn. Because what if we didn't have Greg's instructions? What if we had to figure this out on our end? So you need to be comfortable doing a little experimentation uh, to figure out with the first-hand knowledge how stuff's going to behave. So this is where this section of the video stops. I'm going to cut the video off. I'm going to prime these pieces and I'll be back when they're primed and we'll talk about where we go next. Okay, so here we are. We've got the parts all primed sufficiently, I think. Um, so we're gonna go to the airbrush booth and we're going to start with the base color. We're gonna start with the yellow on this piece here. Um, we'll see how that goes. And anytime with the airbrush, kinda goes without saying, but wear PPE. Gloves are nice to keep paint off your hands. Uh, but most importantly, protect your lungs. Uh, wear a mask to keep those fumes and vapors of aerosol. It's not really fumes, but basically uh, acrylic vapors out of your lungs. So I'll be right back. We'll see how it goes. Welcome back. And here we are, the first christening of my airbrush. And we have what I think is a pretty fucking rock solid yellow, cadmium yellow base coat. So the next thing we will do is we will uh, try the, uh, the turbo door final coat on top of that. I will add as a note. The one-to-one -one ratio that the bottle says, in my opinion, is way too fucking thick. I cut it and it was still like, it was like struggling to come out of the airbrush. So I cut it more to where I got it more of a skim milk consistency. And then I started getting way better paint flow out of my brush. So I think that maybe I might need to just kind of do the same process. Like I'll do the recommended ratios. And I guess I kind of said I was going to do that anyway. I do the recommended ratios and if it does not look liquidy enough, add some more uh, airbrush thinner until we uh, get our happy results. So... Hopefully I'll be back with uh, with the Turbo Dork coat and let's just see how it turns out. All right, so here we are with the um, coat of the Turbo Dork on there and yeah, I would say this is a triumphant success. Really just rad color that's probably not coming out so much in the camera like it is in real life because I can kind of see like, almost like flecks of copper in it that I never noticed when I hand painted it as opposed to spraying it. But uh, it, it, it's definitely exceeding my expectations here. Um, I mean, I'm sure I probably have some ways to improve my airbrush technique and all that good jazz, but uh, this is a good start. So, probably going to hit it with, a, with a, a gloss clear coat just to see what it looks like and probably some uh, some panel lining, and then let's kind of judge the piece at that point. And once we've done that, I think we're pretty good to go on understanding the ratios we're going to want in these paints, and then we'll actually start in the kit. Okay, and here we are with the final results. Uh, Paint-wise, I'm really happy. And yes, there are seam lines on this. It's because it's a practice piece. I'm not removing seams on a practice piece. Also, I'm gonna show you because I'm just never gonna hide things, but like, I didn't wait until my gloss was dry enough. It was a little sticky. So this is like the worst panel line job I've ever done. But I mean, I guess it's it's okay. But, and I still can probably clean it up, even though it's like a practice piece or whatever, but it panel lines okay. The important thing is like the color is coming out great in the panel lines. Just the line work is doo-doo. But honestly, like, that shouldn't be even that much of an issue with my uh, scribed one because the lines are so fucking scribed in there, the marker is going to stay in the lines kind of thing. But the important thing for today is the, is the yellow, is the color, is the, is the leveling, all of which I'm sure there's room for improvement, but I'm very happy with today for my first ever attempt at doing this kind of airbrush. And, like, this is why you also still want to test with an SD model because... Uh, it's the same paint that's going on my real model and you, there's a little bit of a little bit of a detectable difference in the uh, 
and the yellow, like on the wood, it's kind of a, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but you can see it's a slightly different shade, but like, but yeah, uh, so this is cool. Like we're definitely ready to paint this palace Athene and just wait longer to let it dry. Don't be impatient like me before you do your fucking panel lines and it's all scratchy. Anyway, so yeah, I think this is where we're gonna stop for the video today. After my video, I have to go do some stuff, but I will probably go ahead and start painting the palace Athene today. So you'll get uh, another video as we do the palace Athene stuff. <clears throat> so that's it for today and I'll see you next time.